Lecture 24, Nuclear Reactions, Transmutation, Fusion, and Fission. So far, we've looked at only one way that an element can be transformed into another. This is through natural radioactive decay of unstable nuclei. But what if we want to actually cause transmutation ourselves? Transmutation is simply the transformation of one nucleus into another. This can either be achieved by natural processes, like radioactive decay, and later we'll talk about fusion and fission, which also can occur naturally. Or we can artificially cause it by means of nuclear bombardment. In the mid 20th century, we learned how to build particle accelerators that can, that can cause different nuclei and subatomic particles to travel at very high speeds. When they travel at very high speeds, they can cause collisions that have a lot of energy, enough energy to cause nuclear transformations. The first such nuclear bombardment reaction was was done in, in 1935 by the Gillette Carey family. This is Irene Carey and Frederick Gillette, who were the daughter and son-in-law of Mary Carey. In this first reaction, they bombarded aluminum-27 with alpha particles, or helium-4 nuclei, to produce phosphorus-30 and a neutron. Since then, many nuclear bombardment reactions have been done. And probably the most famous example is to create the transuranium elements. These are elements that are beyond uranium-92, the heaviest naturally occurring element. These other elements have to be done, have to be made synthetically through nuclear bombardment reactions. For example, in 1950, Professor Seaborg at the University of California, Berkeley, created californium by bombarding curium-242 with alpha particles to produce californium and a neutron. Again, these are synthetic ways of causing nuclear transformations. Now let's take a look at some natural processes that involve nuclear bombardment reactions. Before we do that, let's take a look at nuclear energy. Where does, when we cause nuclear transformations, oftentimes a great deal of energy is released. Where is this energy coming from? One thing to observe, especially with smaller nuclei, is that if you compare the mass of an atom of a certain element to the total mass of its protons, neutrons, and electrons, you'll find that the mass of the atom is actually less than the sum of the particles that make up that atom. We call this the mass defect. Where's this mass going? How come, how come atoms are less massive than the sum of their parts? When a nucleus is bound together and an atom is created, the, the mass that is missing is actually converted into energy. We can calculate this energy using Einstein's theory of special relativity, the famous E equals mc squared equation. Here, the energy is equal to the binding energy, or the energy that is given off when a nucleus is created is equal to the mass defect, which is delta m, times the speed of light squared. Let's do a calculation to figure out how much energy can be released. Let's calculate the binding energy for a helium atom. We're going to calculate this value in joules and mega electron volts. An electron volt is a unit of energy used for atomic processes. 
One electron volt is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. To think about calculating a nuclear binding energy, we have to think about what parts make up a helium atom. Here's an equation that represents this. Helium has two protons, two neutrons, and the helium atom will have two electrons. All of these parts will make up a helium atom. We're also going to need some extra information and constants to carry out this calculation. We'll need to know the masses of the proton, neutron, and electron, which can be found in electron volts. If we use the E equals mc squared equation to calculate our binding energy, the binding energy will actually come out in SI units, joules. In order for this to happen, we need to have our mass in kilograms. So given is a conversion between atomic mass units and kilograms. We also need the speed of light, which is 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now we're ready to do our calculation. The first thing we do is calculate our mass defect, or our delta M. To do this, we take the mass of the atom, the helium atom, and we subtract off the masses of two protons, two electrons, and two neutrons using our masses in AMUs. This gives us a mass defect of minus, of minus 0 0.030388 atomic mass units. Notice that this delta M is negative because the mass is being lost. Again, in order to get our energy in SI units, which is the joule, we do need to have our mass, our delta M, in kilograms. So our next step is to convert it to kilograms. One atomic mass unit is 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. This gives us a mass defect of minus 5.0460 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms. Note that as you're looking at the physical reasonability of your answers, the mass defect or, and the masses of subatomic particles should be pretty small, as seen here in kilograms. Now that we have our delta M, we're ready to calculate our binding energy. We're going to take the absolute value of our mass defect so that we get a, binding, a positive binding energy, since we're just interested in looking at the magnitude here. But typically, binding energies are negative since they're energy that is released when a nucleus is bound together. So now we substitute in our mass defect into, the, into Einstein's equation and multiply it by the speed of light squared. This gives us a binding energy in units of kilograms meters squared per second squared, or joules. The binding energy is therefore 4.54 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. So there's our, answer, our binding energy in joules. We next want to get our binding energy in mega electron volts, which is a common unit used in calculating binding energies. The next step is just to convert units. We first convert joules into electron volts using the conversion given in the problem. One electron volt is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. This now gives us our binding energy in electron volts, and we're going to convert this now into mega electron volts. The prefix mega means 10 to the 6th, or 1 million. So one mega electron volt is a million electron volts. After this conversion, we get our final binding energy, as 28.3 mega electron volts. Now, this number might seem pretty meaningless to you, as it should because we haven't applied it to anything. But let's, but now, let's apply it. So here's a factoid for you. This is enough energy to light one 100 watt light bulb for about a billion years. 
That's a lot of energy. Note that the filament will probably burn out before you run out of energy to actually burn the light bulb. This means that binding, actually binding nuclei together produces a lot of energy. This is the energy that, this, that is given off by the sun. Since nuclear fusion, or the formation of new nuclei, is what occurs in the sun. Now let's take a look at the, at the binding energies for, for all of our all known atoms. If we plot the nuclear binding energy as a function of the mass number, we get what's called a nuclear binding curve. This shows the binding energy that is given off as the energy as the binding energy for forming different nuclei. There's a few things to note. Nuclear fusion, or the formation of new nuclei from its nucleons, is actually a spontaneous process for most elements until you reach iron 56. Which, if you, if you look at the binding curve, this is actually the top of the, the top of the curve. So fusion is spontaneous until you start to take iron, until you form iron 56. Then there's a problem. That the fusion of iron 56 is actually a non-spontaneous process. What is what are the conditions for nuclear fusion? For nuclear fusion, you actually need to combine at, combine some atomic particles or atoms at very high energies. The reason why this occurs very easily in stars is because stars have the high enough temperatures and, and pressure conditions to cause fusion. The pressures are enormously high and, and as well as temperature in the core of stars. On the right is a one branch of the nuclear fusion process that occurs in the sun given with the binding energy that is released as these processes occur. So not only can you calculate binding energy for individual nuclei, you can do this for nuclear reactions. We're going to focus on just calculating binding energies for nuclei instead of looking at reactions. But here's, that, here's a branch of that process. The first step is that two protons or two hydrogen atoms come, are bombarded with one another to form hydrogen 2, or the deuterium atom, plus a positron, plus a neutrino. This releases a small amount of binding energy. The next step is for the deuterium atom to bombard with another proton to form the helium-3 nucleus and some gamma radiation. This, reduces, this produces a couple of more elect mega electron volts of energy. The final step final, completes the fusion process. The two, hel two helium-3 nuclei come together to form a helium-4 nucleus, which we already know is pretty stable, and two, and two protons, which can be funneled back into the process to create another branch of fusion. This last reaction is what produces the most energy. As mentioned before, fusing nuclei that are larger than iron 56 is actually are actually not is actually non-spontaneous. So how do we get elements? So and in the universe, most of the elements that are created are created in stars. It's spontaneous to fuse not only hydrogen into helium, but helium and other elements in, into larger elements in the lifetime of the star. Until you get to making iron 26. When you make iron 26 in a star, 
and the star, the star tries to fuse the iron 26 together, but this is a non-spontaneous process, and this actually signals the death of the star. Eventually, when large enough stars die, they go supernova. When, when a star supernovas, it creates enough energy to actually bind iron 20 iron 56 and other into larger elements and this is why we and this is how we get lar um, heavier elements such as gold and silver these observations actually cooperate with the distribution of elements in the universe we have much more hydrogen and helium than we do other elements and a very small trace amounts relatively of of the heavier elements. If we look at the nuclear binding curve, we see that not only fusion is pretty spontaneous before you before you try to fuse together iron 56, but it's actually spontaneous to to take heavier nuclei and break them apart. We've seen this when we looked at radioactive decay, particularly alpha decay, that heavy elements will spontaneously become, become lighter elements until they reach the band of stability. Therefore, nuclear fission, or the splitting of heavy elements into smaller elements is spontaneous, particularly if the, if the elements are, the elements have an atomic number over 83. However, we might want to control nuclear fission, as we do when we make bombs or nuclear reactors for energy, by inducing the fission process by neutron bombardment. So why do we ne use neutron bombardment? Well, it turns out that if you that neutron because neutrons are neutral, they can be be fired at a nucleus and stick since there's no electron there's no electronic propul um, repulsion here's an example of a f fission process one example of alpha decay we looked at was uranium 238 the the isotope of uranium actually used in nuclear reactors and nuclear bombs is uranium 235 which is much more unstable. You can take a uranium-235 nucleus and bombard it with a neutron. One of the possible, react, um, one of the possible reactions that it could occur is the formation of barium-140 and, and krypton-93. Also produced is, is three neutrons. These three neutrons can then be released, can, can then bombard three other uranium-235 nuclei, forming more products and more neutrons. These neutrons can th then bombard other uranium-235 nuclei. Eventually, the energy that's released, which is about 172 mega electron volts, builds up per, um, per uranium 235 nucleus builds up and leads to what we call a chain reaction. This is what releases a, a great deal of energy in, in the form of an explosion. And this is how atomic bombs work. If we want to use the energy for good, we could we use this the energy produced to run nuclear reactors, which which is an alternative to fossil fuel energy. Okay, guys, and that is the end of nuclear chemistry. Okay, have a good day.